So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming here in this um, Wednesday morning at an early time. Um, today we are going to discuss uh, the infringement of academic freedoms across the world in the global south and the global north. Uh, yesterday, actually, we were also uh, in our uh, opening panel, we were discussing about that, how authoritarianism taking different forms in different parts of the world. Uh, in some parts, more violent, but at the same time, it's coming from similar, maybe similar dynamics, similar uh, historical moments of neoliberalism. Um, and uh, today we would like to talk about uh, attacks on academic freedoms, attacks on critical critical academics, uh, which is uh, which is a common trait that's happening in different parts of the world, in the so-called the most authoritarian countries like India, like Turkey, but that's also happening in the Europe, in Poland, in Hungary, uh, and in different forms. It's also happening in France, in Germany. Um, so uh, that's taken place in the intersection of more authoritarian, open political processes and repression, but also the neoliberal restructuring of academy, which is also creating a lot of limitations for the expression of um, or for the production of critical knowledge, uh, for the free expression of academics, and also for student activism. Um, and today we would like to talk about the soft and hard measures of authoritarian, uh, authoritarian strategies, authoritarian governance uh, in the field of uh, in the field of academic production. And um, first, we will start with like we are going to go on with the alphabetical order. And we are going to start with Ahim Rohde. Ah, like we are collaborating with Academy in Exile uh, for this uh, for this session. Uh, thank you very much for for your contribution and for being here. Um, of course, I would like to mention that. Um, and um, the other, I am a Irgak Fellow, and the other presenters here today are parts of Academy in Exile. And now first, Ahim is going to talk. Uh, Ahim is a researcher at Freie University, and he's also um, the academic coordinator of uh, Academy in Exile. And he's a Middle East historian, and he's also engaged with the um, uh, Palestine, uh, Palestine issue. Um, so I'm giving the word to you, Ahim. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. It's my on, on? Yes, no. <laughs> so, good morning. Um, nice to be here. Um, for those of you who haven't heard about Academy Nexar before, it's a consortium consisting of four partner institutions, among them the Free University of Berlin, where um, I coordinate uh, a fellowship program for um, scholars at risk from countries across the globe who receive two-year uh, visiting fellowships at our various partner institutions to continue their work um, in Germany. Um, and my colleagues here on the panel are all fellows um, of Academy Nexile at the moment. And my task here is, um, strangely enough, to start with a German case if talking about um, academic freedom. Um, the the, yes, I know it's just about the alphabetical order. <laughs> um, so um, it's a bit counterintuitive, I would say, to um, raise the case of Germany um, um, if we talk about infringements on academic freedom, because it's a liberal democracy, at least in the area um, of um, science and academic freedom. One would probably expect that um, civil rights and individual freedoms and academic freedom um, are guaranteed, the freedom of thought, of expression, Academic freedom and freedom of the arts, after all, is guaranteed in the institution, Article 5, Section 3. Um, and Germany does have a big and a vibrant education sector. Scientists can broadly say and write what they want, and they engage in public debates um, without uh, problems. The politicization of science while existing um, is a far cry from what we see in other countries. The impact of religious ideology in the, epic, in the academic sphere is, I would say, negligible still. Um, fake news or alternative facts, so to say, are in no way considered on an equal footing with serious science. Um, for instance, concerning the evolution or climate change and things like this. 
Um, neither do we see culture wars raging here to a degree that is comparable with the situation in countries where neo-right-wing governments delegitimize, defund, or actively close down certain disciplines like gender studies, as we see happening, for instance, in countries like Hungary or Turkey or Poland. Um, on the contrary, um, as you can see at the example of um, Academy in Exile, Germany has actually become a terre d'accueil, um, a welcoming country for many displaced scholars and scholars at risk from across um, the world. There is a lot of money in the system um, and it's quite productive and um, this is also still not a highly privatized um, system like, for instance, in the US, where Ivy League universities are centers of excellence and stand out against the huge and, to be honest, often mediocre um, rest. It is still at, at its core a public sector. Most universities, and there's more than 100 of them uh, in this country, are state universities and um, access to higher education is still, or should I say, once again, because there were attempts to change this in the um, 2000s. So it is once again free of charge. And that is, of course, um, a considerable achievement if you compare this to the highly um, costly and expensive um, student fees that you pay in other countries. <coughs> but, and here comes the big but, <laughs> Um, neoliberal restructuring and marketization of science have taken their toll on the German academic system. There is a consistent downward trend in state funding of universities, which necessitates their reliance on external funding. And these funds are handed out for projects, smaller, bigger, short term, longer term, but it's all for projects and of course for limited periods of time. Um, on national average, just to give you one number, um, institutional funding for universities on the part of the German lender, the regional states, has decreased over the last two decades from an average of 73% to today 50% of the annual budget of a university, which is um, a notable decrease. Uh, this is, of course, politically intended to foster competition and to push people to attain excellence, as they call it. Um, that is, we're speaking here about the marketization of academia, um, which leads to a stronger stratification of the academic sector along a spectrum where universities of excellence, as they call them, and get a huge chunk of these external funds and has hence also managed to attract the best professors, which in turn generates higher um, uh, you know, um, budgets for uh, external funding. And so this, this is like a self, um, uh, this is a, a cycle that, uh, that p pushes itself forward. <clears throat> um, while many other universities descend into being mere uh, regional teaching colleges. This actually runs against the grain of the institu institu constitutional right uh, of all citizens to have equal access to education and for the state to provide equal standards across the country. And this is all uh, written in, um, uh, in, the, in the Constitution. But of course, this development reflects the neoliberal logic that has dominated German politics since the 1990s, uh, which has reached the academic sector since the 2000s. A negative trend is also visible concerning access to education. As compared to the 1970s or 1980s, when the education sector was broadened and made accessible for people also from less privileged part of, parts of society, working class or non-academic uh, milieus, over the last two decades, the accessibility of higher education has eroded. There is today a much stronger representation of students who already grew up in families where the parents hold academic degrees, while the percentage of students from non-academic households um, has decreased significantly. To be fair, this is not strictly a problem of the higher education sector itself, as is also related to broader contexts like the segmented German school system um, and also other factors beyond the educational uh, sector, but it fits a certain pattern of less inclusivity and more inequality in higher education in Germany. In certain aspects, on the other hand, the academic system has slowly become more inclusive. Um, it's become more internationalized, significantly so if you compare it with the 
2000s over the 1990s, on the level of students, on the level of doctoral candidates, on the level of postdocs, not on the level of professors. <laughs> and the number of women professors has, excuse me, the number of women professors has increased. Um, today we have uh, like 25% of the full professors who are women uh, in, in Germany. Uh, which is up from less than nine per less than ten percent um, in the early two thousands. Yeah, uh, there has also been a considerable numerical growth in the academic sector uh, since the year two thousand, from around fifty thousand full time positions in the academic sector, like research staff. Right, um, the number of research personnel has risen to above six hundred thousand nowadays full-time positions. Um, most of this, and here comes the but, most of this is precarious fixed-term um, positions. Less than 10% of um, academic staff um, are tenured in the German sector, which is far lower than in other um, European or Western countries where otherwise, you know, the level of neoliberalization is comparable. But um, in terms of the... Um, staff management and and the way the positions are structured this is outstanding um in the european um average <clears throat> so uh, getting a tenured position as a researcher is almost like a lottery nowadays um and in this sense the haven for displaced and exiled scientists that germany has become provides no stability um, the new arrivals basically enlarge the pool of highly educated surplus workforce, sorry to say this, <laughs> um, that we see also across other countries uh, uh, in the global north. Um, and the absurdly high proportion of fixed term employment contracts and the science policy that follows the model of an entrepreneurial university with an exaggerated significance ascribed to performance indicators and third party funding. Um, <coughs> sorry. Has an overall negative impact on what I would call academic freedom. It produces mainstreaming and self censorship effects and results in a marginalization of topics um, that are, um, let's say, uh, less marketable, for instance, humanities. Um, it also perpetuates hierarchies in the system that almost seem feudal at times. It results in a dependence of non-tenured staff on their goodwill of professors, who also act as gatekeepers for positions, as referees in peer-reviewed journals, as editors in book series, etc. Hence, non-tenured mid-level researchers take care not to challenge them or their views. Um, and this trend is most pronounced and visible, for instance, in the field of economics, uh, which is today completely dominated by, neo by the neoclassic school of thought on the level of professors, right? While Keynesians or Marxist economists um, are not represented at all on the level of um, professors. So this is, has been a consistent trend for uh, quite a while, and you can see this, um, uh, the result nowadays, very pronounced in the field of economics. So what I'm describing here at the moment are soft factors of infringements on academic freedom, right? There's no like hardcore repression or persecution of scholars going on. Um, these kinds of things only hardly come to play in this country. I remember the so-called radicals decree um, of the 1970s in West Germany. That was a government decree that which led to the exclusion of Marxists and communists from public sector positions in schools and universities and so on. Today, I would say a degree of um, uh, harder uh, f levels of um, uh, infringements on academic freedom can be seen with regard to the um, issue of Israel-Palestine, um, which seems to be um, touched by this kind of um, um, unusually high state activity on, you know, uh, with regard to policing and disciplining public discourse. Uh, I'm thinking here of the um, BDS resolution by the German parliament of 2019, which calls for deplatforming and defunding um, people um, 
who hold positions that are deemed too critical of Israel, um, which is judged as anti-Semitic nowadays. Um, so it's this issue that has been covered under the slogan progressive again, except Palestine, okay? <laughs> we have this very pronounced in Germany. So scholars with openly critical positions regarding Zionism, or even someone who would consistently point out the basic facts of um, the conflict as it historically evolved, would have a hard time being accepted as a professor nowadays in Germany. Uh, in my own field, which is Middle Eastern studies, this has prompted most colleagues to simply refrain from addressing the issue of Israel-Palestine in their research or publicly speaking about Israel-Palestine, while the emerging discipline of Israel studies in some German universities um, mostly refrains from tackling um, topics related to Palestine or the occupation. These are apparent acts of either self-censorship or ideologically motivated on the part of the protagonists themselves. But this is, of course, a larger issue that affects not only the academic sector, it has been, it has chilling effects across the cultural sector. Just think about the firing of the director, former director of the Jewish Museum Berlin, Peter Schäfer, um, in this context, or the deplatforming of a high level um, scholar, Achil Mbembe, in 2000, when was it? 1920? Um, at the occasion of the Ruhr Triennale, a big cultural festival in North Rhine-Westphalia. Uh, on the same accusations. So these kinds of developments actually have triggered a counter reaction. In 2021, early 2021, a group of high representatives um, of academic and cultural institutions founded the so-called initi initi initiative Grundgesetz, basic law, the initiative basic law 5.3, openness to the world, this is how they called it. Um, which calls for an end to what they term a witch hunt against critics of Israel that they see underway in Germany, as elsewhere in Western countries. There's also, by partly the same people, um, uh, a, an alternative definition to um, um, anti-Semitism, um, which is trying to challenge the widely accepted um, ERA uh, definition of anti-Semitism because they criticize it for not failing to adequately differentiate between um, critics of Zionism, critics of Israel and, and anti-Semitism. So that's a larger issue which we might elaborate on further on in the discussion. I just um, raised it here shortly in the context of infringements on academic freedom. Another sector where I can see political pressures at play, not on the part of the German political class and uh, media people, but rather from um, external factors um, that also sometimes produces self-censorship among scholars is um, visible in my field of area studies, for instance, with regard to China. China is a powerful player in Germany and um, German universities have huge vested interests. Um, for instance, the free university is having an, they have an office in, in Beijing. There's lots of um, scientific collaboration going on. Also money is involved between German and Chinese universities. Um, there is a global network of Confucius Institutes, maybe you have heard of them, um, funded through the Chinese Ministry of Education. Um, and they have opened um, branches in many uh, Western countries, including in Germany. There's like 19 or something Confucius Institutes in Germany alone, um, mostly um, attached to various universities um, through um, like collaboration treaties. Mm. Through these networks, um, and through um, threats of sanctioning non-compliant scholars, be they Chinese visiting scholars in Germany or German scholars who work on China, um, this produces um, self-censorship effects um, among scholars in public policy institutions and think tanks in universities. Um, so here the Chinese government is actually able to exert a meaningful degree of influence on scholarship and public discourse regarding China in Germany. And this is an infringement on academic freedom, obviously, which is also 
has been noticed by the Ministry of Education and other players. The University of Hamburg, for instance, has um, um, ended its um, collaboration treaty with the Confucius Institute um, at Hamburg University. So there is a kind of um, um, trend towards segregating um, the Confucius Institutes and the universities, which I think also is um, the order of the day. Attempts by foreign governments to prevent criticism of their policies within Germany have been noted also on the part of Turkey or Egypt or Iraq in you know, different periods of time. But these are far less powerful players um, than China. Well, that's one factor I wanted to raise. And there is last point um, also... Um, conservative attempts to kind of hijack the topic of academic freedom from within Germany, from within the academic system. And I would like to raise the um, example of the Netzwerk Wissenschaftsfreiheit. It's called Network of Network Ac Academic Freedom Network. No. Um, founded in 2019 by about 70 academics, mostly from German universities. Um, today it has 640 members. Um, they, the Academic Freedom Network, want to defend the freedom of research and teaching against ideologically motivated restrictions for which they hold politicized students and colleagues responsible. If one follows the argumentation of the Academic Freedom Network, academic freedom today is threatened first and foremost by the exaggerated political correctness in German universities which leads to a cancel culture and in connection with the economization of science to an increasing pressure to conform and self-censorship of science. Uh, obviously, to my mind, um, other imbalances of the German science system are systematic. Um, for example, 75% of professors are male and more than 90% have a German passport. <laughs> um, in the corona... Um, in the corona uh, crisis, female researchers with children paid uh, with additional career losses, like um, statistically speaking, all children of academics are still three times as likely to find a way to university as young people whose parents have not studied. These are structural imbalances in the system and other factors I've mentioned before. So in this sense, a narrowing of perspectives and academic uh, of perspectives and academic discourse is nothing new, really, but rather has a tradition in German universities. It is precisely those, yes, I will finish. It is precisely those who make up the vast majority of the members of the Academic Freedom Network, that is white men, <laughs> who usually have the floor, right? Most come from disciplines such as law, philosophy, history, or pol political science. These are established disciplines with a long tradition and secure academic standing in the system, in contrast to disciplines, newer disciplines such as area studies or gender studies, which are often precariously financed and under more political pressure. Um, perhaps the founding call for the network of academic freedom is kind of um, a reaction to the slowly increasing diversity of perspectives represented in the German academic landscape. Those who have been unchallenged at the top for, of the hierarchy for a very long time are suddenly getting nervous as a result. Indeed, several of the signatories of this initiative are active also in other more outspoken right-wing initiatives, for instance, regarding the delegitimization of gender studies and concerning issues of migration and diversity. These uh, discourses exist in Germany, but they're not as strong and pronounced as in other countries, maybe. So and with this, I close and leave other issues up for the discussion later on. Thank you. situation in detail in Germany. Uh, and now Arshi is going to talk. Arshi uh, is from um, Kashmir and uh, she received her PhD degree uh, in uh, from, I'm so sorry, Jawaharlal Nehru University and she studied uh, Kashmiri nationalism in the last three decades. And now she's uh, affiliated with Freie University Institute of 
um, African and Asian Studies. Humboldt University. Ah, Humboldt University. I'm so sorry. And um, and she is uh, now studying the everydayness of life between Kashmiri Muslims and Kashmir Pandits. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here. So uh, uh, I think I'll just start with the presentation and meanwhile make my, make my own uh, interventions. So uh, if we talk about academic freedom in, in, in India, uh, there, ha there has been a se uh, severe structural co uh, constraint to the academic freedom in India during the last, uh, I think, near, uh, nearly eight years. Uh, since independence, ever since after independence, uh, the years from 1975 to 1977, which were the years of emergency in India, political emergency in India, were hard. But nothing comes closer to what has been there uh, in the last eight years. Uh, it's, uh, there's been a sharp downward decline in India's po position in the academic uh, freedom index. And uh, I'll give you a, a brief, a, a rough idea of the higher education landscape before I, uh, you know, move on further. According to the All India Survey on Higher Education, India has 993 universities, 39931 colleges and uh, 10,725 standalone institutions. Of these 385 universities and 78% of the colleges are privately managed, while 394 universities and 60.53 of the colleges are located in rural areas. 37.4 million persons, male and female, are enrolled in higher education in India. The gross enrollment ratio in higher education in India is 26.3, which is between 18 to 23 years. Certain categories of citizens have less access to higher education. For instance, scheduled castes have a gross enro enrollment ratio of, say, about 23%, and scheduled tribes have a gross enrollment ratio of about 17.2%, as compared to the national gross e enrollment ratio of 26.3%. Muslims, however, only have about 52 of the student population, compared to the overall population of about 14.2% uh, of the of the student population of the population uh, the mix of public and private universities central and state universities uh, deemed universities, institutes of national importance, state-aided and minority institutions, affects the nature of institutional autonomy and subsequently academic freedom. So basically, whatever uh, ceiling you are in would determine what kind of academic freedom uh, the institute is going to have. So central universities earlier would have slightly more uh, academic freedom than state universities or, or, or deemed universities, but now there has been a total uh, change of scenario. And uh, also like public and private universities have different kinds of regulatory structures, incentives and even legal guarantees. For example, minority institutions and private universities are not bound by quotas for affirmative action on caste grounds for students or for faculty. The state universities in India are dependent on the state governments for selection of leaders, funding and other regulatory issues. Many private colleges are for profit professional oriented ventures run by local business families and unlikely they are going to encourage any uh, critical thought or extra mural or intramural discussion that might invoke questions or uh, you know on the questions on academic freedom or uh, or, 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 or uh, say or political situations if i if we look at the uh, at the legal framework for the academic freedom in india <coughs> There's a constitutional guarantee which comes with Article 19, 1A of the Constitution, which, which uh, gives you a freedom to speech, which provides you freedom to expression, which ensures you right to practice any profession or carry on any occupation. However, what has been happening, like uh, uh, Gautam Bhatia, a lawyer who uh, writes on the freedom of speech, writes, has, has referred to many of the threats to books, films, or other forms of expression uh, which ha uh, has been which has been coming in the last eight years has been uh, usually coming from the far right, far Hindu right. Many of the threats to books, films and other forms of expression in India have come from usually powerful communities claiming their sentiments were hurt and governments have resorted to the threat to public order and morality in banning these forms of expression. 
In in judgments after judgments, the Supreme Court had decreed the heckler's veto, clarified that the task of maintaining law and order rested with the authorities, and the risk of vigilante caused disturbances could not be a ground for curtailing freedom of speech. However, it's also written that police and other authorities continue to apply curbs because of other such laws, such as Section 124A of the IPC, uh, allow, allowing for the charge of sedition to be leveled against dissenting citizens, while uh, 29, uh, Section 295A allows police to ban books on the grounds of hurting religious sentiments. So basically what I'm trying to say here is like there are uh, legal provisions which invalidate there are illegal provisions like terrorism, like supporting mass terrorism or, or uh, disturbing uh, sentiments of a community. They, there are legal provisions which infer on the right to, right to freedom, which is Article 19. So this is curtailed in a very nice, in a very orchestrated, in a very nice balanced way where these, uh, uh, where these judicial tools are used by the courts. Uh, mostly it's mostly it's supposed like you know uh, the, the state is under threat the students are creating ruckus a book is creating national disharmony many of the cases where university authorities have denied students and faculty the right to hold public meetings discussions of film screenings on issues they deem controversial would fall squarely under the right uh, under the scope of the right to free speech upheld by the supreme court even prior to 2014, when uh, the uh, current government came to power, many events, especially those which touched on sensitive issues like Kashmir or Naxalites, armed Maoists fighting the Indian state, were called off because of the threats from uh, a right-wing student body called ABVP, Akhil Bharati Vidyarthi Parishad. It's a student wing of the BJP's parent organization, uh, RSS. Not surprisingly, the ABVP, uh, Akhil Bharati Vidyati Parishad's ability to veto campus events has dramatically increased since the BJP came to power in 2014. However, there has been no attempt to take the matters to court and increasingly under a debilitated judiciary, less hope that they will be entertained. On the other hand, uh, since 2014, student leaders have been charged with sedition with various sections of unlawful uh, activities prevention act india's anti terror legislation which uh, under which it is difficult to even get bail conceivably various other provisions in the fundamental rights charter of the constitution could be invoked to defend academic freedom such as right to life which has been expansively inter uh, interpreted to mean life with dignity in so far as academic freedom involves expanding the scope of viewpoints that may be brought into the academy, whether of women, minorities or exploited groups like scheduled castes or scheduled tribes in India, one could invoke Article 14, 15, 16, which uh, provide for equality, prohibit uh, discrimination and assure equality of opportunity in public em employment. Some cases like the discrimination against the members of Ambedkar Students Association at the University of Hyderabad or women students on the campus of Banaras Hindu University would be covered under this. The constitution also lays down fundamental duty of the state and citizens to develop scientific temper, humanism and spirit of inquiry and reform, as well as to strive towards excellence in all spheres of individual and collective activity, so that the nation uh, constantly rises to higher levels of endeavor and achievement. Both these should enshrine the promotion of academic freedom as, in, as a fundamental duty of states and citizens. However, this section of the constitution is not justi justicable. India has signed and ratified International Convention of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, of which Article 13 and 15 are especially relevant to academic freedom in the higher education. Unfortunately, Indian courts have been cautious in uh, incorporating international conventions in their decisions, the one exception being SIDAO, which gives ri uh, rise to India's first guidelines and laws against sexual harassment at workplace, including the universities. So the components uh, of academic freedom are well defined and are broadly the same across all countries. For instance, academic freedom in index is coded on the following indicators. Freedom to research and teach, freedom of academic exchange and dissemination, institutional autonomy, campus integrity and freedom of academic and cultural expression. 
if I'm t- if I talk about uh, academic freedom as a as a, as a as a wider subset of freedom of expression and pertains to the freedom of individual teacher and student to teach and study both within the classroom and outside academic freedom within the classroom is often justified by the idea of university as a marketplace of ideas or as a space where heretical ideas can be discussed even if they may pose a threat to public order if voiced outside <coughs> In order to ensure freedom of study, teach and research, academic freedom requires institutional autonomy. The right of a university to frame its own protocols for teaching and uh, discussion. The nature of autonomy is well summed up uh, in one of the higher education recommendations in India in 1966, which noted that autonomy was needed in three spheres, selection of students, selection of faculty and selection of courses, as well as themes of research. There were three levels at which autonomy was uh, was to be exercised: uh, autonomy within a university, autonomy of a university with relation to the university system as a whole, such as uh, you know the funding bodies, autonomy of the university as the system as a whole in relationship to the state and the centre. Academics are also uh, are also called upon to deploy their expert opinion in the in the fields outside the classroom and the campus. Sometimes this may be directly within their research arena. At other times, they are called upon as you know general experts in the field. It's the engagement with non-academics or the extramural activities of the scholars, which are mostly contested by the state in India, and also become a st- site of resistance where academic freedom comes closest to the freedom of expression. It's important to note that the lines between classroom and extramural activities are often and increasingly blurred especially in the social sciences given the range of sources internet films that teachers draw upon the importance of public discussions to supplement classroom teaching and the increasing pressure on academics to have a public presence through media engagement or writing or say maybe through twitter academic students academic freedom for students must inevitably include the right to challenge existing power structures which hinder their access to knowledge whether uh, say gender movements like me too or religion or caste movements for students from marginalized communities many of whom are first generation learners and who feel discrimination within the classroom and outside uh, assertion of their rights or identity is often seen as politicizing the campus however the purpose of this education must go beyond classroom teaching and include an assertion of dignity and social mobility to the extent that education is as much as about increasing democracy as it's about increasing scientific knowledge extramural and intramural activities are deeply intertwined i'll spend couple of minutes about the political economy of higher education in india the lack of tenure as a precondition for economic unfreedom is the is the is uh, is is uh, is a mechanism to uh, ensure is is a is a mechanism to ensure that there's no political dissent or the academic freedom gets inhibited giving the increasing precarious uh, precarity of the teaching workforce the majority of jobs which are now contractual not it is difficult to find time to do research but there are also serious concerns about not alienating management senior faculty which limit free speech many institution many institutions especially private universities require that academics get clearance from their superiors while publishing uh, be it a research piece or an opinion piece further the nature of global publishing industry including the high cost of accessing journals and the inequalities of peer review turns what appears to be a global free flow of academic knowledge into one another with 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 specific barriers while issues of funding or the new concerns created by the pandemic in terms of internet inequality are critical to academic freedom they are beyond the scope of my uh, Uh, scope of my talk here uh, uh, like when pandemic occurred i'll just quote an uh, example when pandemic happens uh, universities had to be packed had to be closed off and students had to go back to their uh, uh, to their hometowns many of where internet is was not uh, available many many of the places where uh, there wasn't many many of the places where there wasn't easy availability of internet or even say electricity uh, repeated repeated uh, requests from the students after like the f- first wave of pandemic was over or even after second wave of pandemic was over repeated requests from the students there was no 
after repeated requests of the of the students that the campuses must be opened because there is no internet there is no library that they can access there is no uh, system of a unified access to uh, getting access to libraries the campuses was not were not being opened campuses were not being opened because uh, how the the central government had dealt with the pandemic it it could have become a point of of repression during the uh, point of uh, it could have become a point of revolt within the campuses particularly in political campuses like uh, uh, in campuses which are fairly politicized like uh, jawaharlal nehru university or jamia millia islamia so it was better to keep the campuses closed for as long as possible uh, without students having any access to library or any other material i believe like student uh, the campuses have recently opened i think 2 months ago the campuses have opened uh the the restrictions of institutional autonomy are affecting different spheres such as the selection of university leaders or vice chancellor uh, chancellor selection of faculty selection of students framing of courses and several other aspects of the university some of these such as selection of university leaders are structural constraints that go back to the colonial period <coughs> so far the main body to regulate higher education in india has been the university grants commission which was set up in 1956 the ugc act 1956 describes its core function as the coordination and determination of standards in universities in consultation with universities the ugc is responsible for disbursing funds to central universities and select other institution selected other institutions as well as regulating fees determining the qualifications of faculty and for setting minimum standards of instruction however uh, as uh, nirja uh, gopal jayal has pointed out in the last decade or so the ugc has seen uh, se uh, has seen a steady accre uh, accretion of power and displayed a heightened propensity to function as an institution of education ministry like like i said there has been a subversion in the faculty uh, uh, of in the faculty appointments in the last four years of last last six years we have seen a part people who have a uh, uh, people who have a connection with a particular political party are getting access to faculty positions all the uh, top leadership positions or the top managerial positions within the university structures be it uh, ugc be it uh, vice chancellorships of the universities they are given to a, a particular set of a client a uh, population which have a particular affiliation with the with the with the right wing uh, with the right wing government there have been political appointments to the university leadership most of the appointments say indian council for historical research indian council for social research indian council for philosophical research jnu banaras hindu universities some other iits and these are institutes of premier these were institutes of premier excellence at least before 2014 they have all been uh, disbursed like to the hand pick bunch of people who obviously have their allegations with the state then uh, institutional harassment of of faculty and students uh, has been on a rise like um, uh, in the cases of students who dissent universities are routinely resorting to rustication expulsion and withholding of scholarships in an emblematic case from hyderabad central university a dalit student rahul uh, rohit vemela died by suicide bringing to light the extent of caste discrimination and arbitrary decision making within universities and uh, 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 while I speak this, uh, 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 more than 200 or I think more than 250 student leaders in Delhi who were part of uh, the uh, anti uh, anti citizenship uh, um, uh, CA anti CA uh, protests, they are languishing in in various jails in India. Uh, uh, they have been. Uh, <coughs> particularly the crackdown is in is severe on 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 uh, students who come from kashmir or who have a muslim identity this crackdown intensifies uh, in, in manifold ways if if you have a student identity or if you have a identity of a kashmiri uh, muslim with you like the kashmir university has a, uh, houses an army camp within the university so does uh, you know uh, one of the university called manipur university located in the northeast india it also houses a uh, uh, uh it also houses a, a army camp within the university premises so the uh, surveillance uh, 
the kind of censorship around uh, uh, around issues like Kashmir uh, is, is is supreme. And whenever something happens, they, the students in various parts of Punjab who are who are like uh, you know who are in private universities, they are the first targets of the of the mob violence. In in recent uh, instances, we have seen mobs entering uh, campuses and beating up Kashmiri students or beating up Muslim students. Uh, the provocation could be anything: a movie, a cricket match somebody's food choice the landscape is uh, uh, one of the concerns that mostly i hear from uh, you know fellow kashmiris now is we can't send our children to delhi we can't send our children to uh, uh, you know, Hyderabad. We can't send our children to other parts of India because uh, you never know what leads to what leads to what, what provocation leads uh, leads where. So, like the favorite destination for uh, for children from Kashmir is becoming Bangladesh because uh, families feel at least they won't be beating up in Bangladesh for being Kashmiris or being Muslims. Then, uh, strangely, Turkey is picking up because you pay your money yeah. <laughs> and. You just uh, you you pay some money and you get an admission in Turkey. So uh, I I also know of people who are going for like uh, going to for their bachelor's degree to all the way to West Indies, and like families are pawning of ornaments and properties and whatnot just to ensure that children are safe on campuses. I'll end here and uh, I'll uh, make more interventions during the question answer session. I think we will have a lot to discuss on that, you know, how student activism is getting or the autonomy of the campus are getting impaired. And now Tatiana is going to talk. Um, Tatiana is uh, a philosopher uh, who also a PhD uh, from uh, Lomonosov Moscow State University. Um, now she's an Academy in Exile Fellow at KVE at SN. Um, and she is studying uh, the female philosophers in Russia and the Soviet Union in the 20th century. Um, yeah, I'm giving the word to you, Tatiana. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. Uh, so I will be talking about the authoritarian strategies in uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, now it is really a lot to say, um, but uh, I will start. Uh, um, I, I will start uh, to talking about the earlier time. Um, so uh, authoritarian strategies uh, persisted in post-Soviet universities in the 2000s and 2010s. I graduated from Moscow State University, a philosophy department uh, that was rooted in a Soviet ideological machine. I went to the higher school of economics, HSE, uh, the most liberal university in Russia, as it was called until uh, 2020. Uh, even earlier um, at HSE, I have heard the phrase, uh, we are having uh, rules of the game. Uh, from the administrative staff of the HSC. Um, so they were talking like the rules of the game are these and the rules of the game are that. This was a sign not only of a post-Soviet but also uh, of a neoliberal uh, neo university. After the 2019 civil protests, uh, there were elections of the State Duma, the lower house of uh, Russia's Federal Assembly. The situation in the academy began to, uh, began to worsen considerably. In 2020, my contract was not renewed, as were many other colleagues um, in the philosophy department. I didn't fa uh, find a job and applied for an academy in exile scholarship, so that's why I'm here. Uh, in, uh, and uh, I have to say uh, that uh, um, for many years uh, in Russia, we haven't had uh, real elections. Uh, uh, I mean, president elections and um, other governmental structures elections, as well as rector's elections. Uh, so in 1987, 
USSR brought back the elections of rectors, which regulated uh, the procedure for electing the rectors by secret ballot of the university faculty. Um, but at present, um, uh, according to the legislation of the Russian Federation in the field of education of uh, December 29, 2012, uh, the head of uh, the organization, uh, educational organization, uh, uh, meaning rector, is elected by uh, the general meeting of or conference of employees or appointed by the founder of the educational organization, as well as in cases stipulated by federal laws by the president of Russian Federation, so uh, rectors of Moscow State University and St. Petersburg State Universities are elected by the president of Russian Federation and my university, uh, my university rector uh, is um, controlled by the government of Russian Federation. Uh, so this law uh, was introduced uh, to my university, my for the former university, higher school of economics, and the, uh, as well as the Russian Academy of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture. I don't know why. <laughs> so. Um, uh, the same rule. Uh, after, <laughs> after this date, the High School of Economics Rector started to introduce new teaching contracts. So it was in 2012. Uh, Rector Kuzminov, um, Yaroslav Kuzminov, though's wife, is the chairman of the Central Bank of the Russian Federation at the moment. Uh, explain the motivation behind the new type of uh, teaching contracts uh, by the need to support teachers who are actively publishing in journals or are examples of teaching excellence. As a result, after 10 years of, um, after the 10 years uh, of this uh, new thing, the teaching load um, uh, remain the same. So it is like uh, 700 to 900 teaching hours per year. Uh, and the teacher's rating became dependent on the obligation to publish in a highly cited uh, journals under the treat of uh, non-renewal of contracts. Uh, with such a workload, it was hard to think of anything else but uh, the um, teaching load and um, pu publishing in a proper journals, um, not freedom uh, of speech and all, all, all other things, but uh, perhaps uh, that was the goal of such an implementation. At the same time, a strict hierarchy was maintained and the subject of the university um, harassment was silenced and banished. Uh, in 2017, students at the School of Philosophy of the Higher School of Economics organized a student journal, DOXA. Their way, they protested against professors. They, they wrote uh, against professors with the names, actually, who allowed racist, anti-Semitic, anti-LGBT remarks in their lectures. Uh, at, the, at the time, it was already clear that the professors themselves and teachers uh, and staff themselves in the university wouldn't be able to change anything about the existing structure. It was around this time uh, that the faculty contracts began to include the phrase uh, that the university was not a place for politics, and uh, professors have to sign uh, in this contract. Uh, this means that opposition leaders had no place at the HSC, but pro-Putin, that is state uh, leaders, um, politics did. Another, another uh, authoritarian strategy has been the traditionalist critique of feminism. Um, LGBTQ plus uh, and, and other things. For example, a very suspicious attitude towards uh, 
trans students were uh, um, were employed uh, by some professors. Uh, so that students uh, uh, began to find some support from other professors and teachers at the universities. This attitude was to be expected from conservatives, uh, conservatives, conservative professors at the university who criticized the new ethic as they called different topics under this common new ethics brand, as they call it. Uh, so, uh, the different topics are the problem of harassment, Black Lives Matter, the LGBTQ plus movement, inclusion and political correctness, power and hierarchy, quotas for women and the new ecology. Um, but this view was also shared by those who seemed critical to the conservative position. Uh, in criticizing female students and professors who spoke out about harassment at the universities, they defended the value of freedom, their own value of freedom, I would say. After all, female students are adults and decide for themselves whether to have an affair with a professor or not. I mean, this, this, this was the uh, words of uh, people who wrote about that. Professors further distanced themselves from student, uh, students' movement even more, while student aid groups uh, multiplied. Many cases of harassment were made public in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Of course, for the most part, universities sought to get rid of, the, of their critics. Cancel culture became a very frequent re uh, reference to the problem of Western society coming to a Russian soil uh, in the 21st century <laughs> again. Uh, now that Russia is at war in Ukraine, many professors continue to rant about the horrors of the cancellation now of the Russian culture. All along, gender studies have been a marginal topic in Russian universities and not supported by the administration. In 2021, the Ivanovo Gender Research Center was named a uh, foreign agent. Before that, several gender centers uh, had been closed down in Moscow, St. Petersburg. Uh, I read a course on feminist philosophy at the independent volunteer platform, Free University Moscow. <laughs> uh, before that, uh, um, we held seminars on gender as well as on neoliberalism neoliber on the um, anti-university platform. So there were be appeared uh, a number of uh, volunteer platform um, um, outside universities. A few months ago, the rector of the HSE uh, Kuzminov was removed and the rector of School of Social uh, and Economic Studies, uh, the private university, his name is Sergei Zuev, uh, have been imprisoned. Um, and he, he's still there, he's still in the prison. Courses related to liberty, political philosophy and rights and freedoms in Moscow and St. Petersburg have been closed or restructured very quickly. Since uh, the February uh, 24th, with the outbreak of military action by the Russian army against Ukraine, many professors on the one have, hand have declared their support for Putin. Uh, and we also have this very famous, the letter of rectors, then, uh, where they are um, signed the words that they are together with the, the government politics and so on and so forth. Uh, however, the majority, it seems to be, uh, it, it seems to me, the, the majority of my, my colleagues, <laughs> at least, began to take an anti-war stance and sign letters calling the special operation, not a special operation, but the war. However, the state uh, had promised to punish such people for discrediting the Russian army 
with prison sentences up to 10 years. Many colleagues continue to talk about the war with students, and recently we have seen a wave of denunciations. A colleague told me about the denunciation of her feminist course alone before, so, so it, it was before uh, she, uh, she, she got an information uh, that uh, her professor colleague uh, uh, wrote about her course on gender studies. But uh, now uh, it, it is going on on, uh, on, on on people who are talking about the war in Ukraine at the universities. And it uh, has led to it have led to dismissals of those uh, colleagues. Uh, they, there are professors and students, uh, as well as administrators, who are zealously enforcing the new rules uh, of the game. Uh, memories of Stalin time and the gulag after the denunciation immediately arise. A huge number of my colleagues have already left uh, or are planning to leave the country. Colleagues feel atomization and efforts to overcome it must be directed towards developing new forms of solidarity. It would be good to talk about solidarity, about the possibilities to create professional circles again, about the feeling of having to start again. I would be happy to learn about uh, ways of institutionalizing solidarity, counter strategies against authoritarianism that could be undertaken in the new circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Now Thomas is going to talk. Uh, Thomas Kitlinski is a political philosopher from Poland, and um, his uh, um, his research focuses on contemporary society, culture and politics, intellectual history, uh, critical theory, and he's also an activist. Um, he defends the women's rights, LGBTQI rights, labor and refugee rights, and now he's um, affiliated. He's a researcher at Fry University. So thank you very much, Thomas. And Academy Next. Uh, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good morning and thank you for having me. Uh, well, uh, this conference is uh, concerned with uh, authoritarianism in the South, but it seems that in Poland and the so-called North, uh, there are many parallelisms to uh, the South, to the authoritarianism of, of the South. It seems that uh, everything that uh, Arshi was talking about uh, in India, in Kashmir, uh, applies to Poland. Uh, likewise, uh, Russia and what uh, Tatiana so eloquently uh, said. Uh, well, let me start with my own private definition of uh, academic freedoms. Academic freedoms are for me uh, attitudes of hospitality, hospitality to the, the, toward the other, to the stranger, uh, to those whom uh, we um, deny, reject, uh, outcast. Uh, and when I was a student under communism in, in Poland in the late 80s, it seemed in the 20th century, <laughs> in which I still live, uh, back then, it seemed that academic freedom at the university, at my university in Lublin, was uh, quite uh, okay. I mean, now it's much, much worse. It, it has gone to the dogs. Uh, under communism, uh, there was a community of hospitable students and scholars and auxiliary personnel. I would like to uh, 
draw our attention to uh, the auxiliary personnel and it will be an obsession of, of my little uh, talk now uh, to begin with because uh, it seems that interclass solidarity is of prime import. Uh, solidarity between or among classes back then under communism was developed, perhaps sometimes artificially, but still it was so crucial and we really never looked back at our cleaning ladies or Porters. Uh, there was a lot of hospitality to, uh, to, to, to the auxiliary personnel from us students, from professors, and uh, gleichfalls the uh, auxiliary personnel was quite hospitable to, to us. And what happened just uh, after the transition, the so-called democratic transition, transition to capitalism, really? Uh, well, uh, privatization of universities started, uh, began, and uh, outsourcing of the auxiliary personnel. At my university, Lublin University, as I said, Marie Curie University, uh, close to Zamosh where Rosa Luxemburg was born. I'm very proud of that. Uh, Lublin University uh, decided, or the rector of it, the rector of it, decided to outsource the uh, auxiliary personnel of our university which counted uh, 400 people, uh, most of them uh, women, mostly cleaning ladies, to tell you the truth. Uh, we protested, and there was solidarity still back then. Uh, we teachers, we students and we auxiliary per personnel uh, were in solidarity, in concert, and started a petition, open letters to the media, uh, as well as a, a mini strike, a demonstration in uh, front of the commencement. You know, my university, now it's my former university because I couldn't stay the infringement of academic freedoms of this university and I, I, I left it this, this year. Uh, this former university of, of, of mine is the first uh, communist university of Poland. It was established uh, in October 1944. So still when the crematoria of Auschwitz were in full swing, I'm afraid, uh, this university started working in Lublin. Uh, well, the commencement is to commemorate this uh, inauguration of uh, October 1944. And during this commencement, the auxiliary personnel stood together with us and with, first of all, students. And one of the cleaning ladies uh, tossed uh, an egg at the rector. So it was quite a brave, I don't have to tell you it was brave. Uh, there was police, although officially there can't be police at Polish universities, but the rector uh, ordered police, police, and it was quite a brave uh, act and uh, quite quite a symbol for me. Instead of the statue to Madame Curie, perhaps we need a statue to this very uh, lady whom I later got to know and uh, was my most uh, frequent uh, chatter during all my career at the university. <laughs> she, she's amazing and she's still there. Uh, 
she, she tossed an egg. Uh, well, to our surprise, uh, the uh, outsourcing didn't happen. Uh, it was a miracle. I, I was amazed and we were all amazed. And uh, to tell you the truth, uh, the, this was the miracle of solidarity, as Tatiana called it, solidarity among classes, but also the fact that uh, the auxiliary personnel unionized and uh, that was quite something uh, alongside solidarity, which from a workers' a trade union became under capitalism just a uh, far right part, political party. Uh, alongside teachers' union, the union uh, of, uh, of the auxiliary personnel became very strong. I, uh, I joined it quite early and uh, it's, it's, still, it's still there and it's my hope uh, down, uh, down there. Uh, well, the situation uh, aggravated in 2005, 2007, when the first dictatorship of the uh, ruling party, which is now in uh, rule two, uh, the law and justice, which has not have nothing to do with law and justice, of course, it's just a label. Uh, a far right party, uh, which uh, already s started some infringement of, on academic freedoms. And uh, then, uh, the civic platform, a liberal party came and nothing, uh, nothing um, has, nothing had improved. Uh, as Tatiana was saying about the uh, election of the rectors, sad suddenly rectors were uh, to be elected by the Minister of Education and Science. And it was the worst possible uh, scenario. Likewise, uh, the chairs of departments and uh, uh, deans, they were no longer, and they are no longer uh, chosen, elected. Uh, well, uh, that uh, made me thinking and made many of us, especially in the trade union, thinking. But the worst came in 2015 when uh, law and justice, the law and justice party uh, took the domination. Uh, well, um, the uh, ultra-nationalist uh, the ultra how, how what, what 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 shall I call him? Because it's he's he's my personal nemesis. His name is uh, Przemysław Czarnek. He was the governor of the Lublin region and uh, he became the Minister of Education and Science. Uh, I try to combine, as, as you've so kindly said, uh, research, teaching and activism, and that's why in my activism I do some art projects. And part of my project uh, was uh, commissioning uh, a public art festival in Lublin, uh, which included uh, uh, an installation, a pyre of signs of uh, names of citizen towns where Polish Catholics perpetrated pogroms on their Jewish neighbors. Uh, this is the most uh, tragic part of uh, history of Poland. 
and it's part of the Holocaust. Uh, by the way, the Polish parliament under the uh, presently ruling party outlawed blaming Poland for any crimes committed uh, during the Holocaust. So it was my crime to uh, commission this uh, installation, this pyre of, of names. Uh, my artist was Dorota Nieznalska, an outstanding uh, emerging uh, woman artist. Uh, well, this uh, installation provoked an outrage of Przemysław Czarnek, the governor of the Lubrin region. Uh, he called it anti-Polish and abominable. And uh, demanded an immediate removal of it. We didn't comply and uh, the installation was there uh, in Lublin for, for a month as the festival was planned. And can you imagine that just uh, uh, after a month, my university gave a medal to Przemysław Czarnek, to the governor of the Lublin region, the well-known anti-Semite, homophobe, uh, misogynist, Islamophobe. Uh, well, I wrote an open letter to the media uh, protesting it. And that was the beginning of my problems, real problems, when I finally uh, <laughs> I was looking for the, the help of the academy in exile. And here I, I am in, in exile. Uh, so uh, I wrote that the governor of Lublin region prides himself in offending uh, Jews, Ukrainians, Muslims, the LGBT community and women for whom he sees no social role other than the reproduction of children. And the university gave a medal of honor, uh, even uh, called and named in Latin, uh, Amicis Universitatis Marie Curie Skłodowska, <laughs> to make it even more absurd. Uh, well, that was the nadir of my experience with the Polish infringement of academic freedoms. But what are my counter strategies? For sure, for sure the uh, solidarity among classes and uh, academicism as activism. I think that we cannot uh, close ourselves off in an ivory tower of universities and we must go into the Arantian public uh, realm to reach out, to reach out to the others, to, to the strangers, to extend hospitality. Thank you. So all of you touched upon very important subjects um, um, and how these different, uh, different systems of power and domination intersect uh, and creating all these offenses on academic freedoms. Um, so actually, I don't want to make it longer. I'm sure that you have questions. Maybe you can move on to your questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, like if we, we will take like three questions first, and then we are going to take another round of that three. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, uh, for the presentation. I, you know, it was very useful also to see the commonalities. But I want to also speak about the 
impossibility of solidarity in a neoliberal situation. I mean, this is my pet topic and we always talk about it because I, I know, I'm, first of all, it's not about everybody. First, you have to always make that thing. Uh, and the thing is also, in the, if, if you look at the German system, it's a pretty precarious situation. And, uh, and then you're coming as an international scholar, you know, and then what happens is like, especially in an authoritarian context, you can't do any of this research in your country. There is zero money. Whereas in Germany, people can raise millions to study this. And very often, it's creating employment for more white people, generally white men. And there are these tourist researchers who arrive and do all these things and go and publish. Whereas somebody else is like, you know, probably in jail. And, and I mean, what are the limits of this solidarity, you know? And, and also, they're also precarious. Like, you know, most of these people, people are precarious. They have their own issues to deal with, you know? And uh, how do you, I mean, sometimes, I mean, in India, we even start saying that, you know, let's just talk about coffee and chocolate to these people and nothing else, you know? So, I mean, this is also a problem and that impossibility of solidarity and impossibility of creating that, that space, which is welcoming both ways, you know? Welcoming for an outsider researcher here as well as somebody who is coming there. And it's, that there is like a huge capital problem, you know? The, the, all, the, all the money is here and there's nothing there, you know? And uh, how do you deal with this? And as academics, you, we will work in structures like this, which is all white researchers researching on Global North, you know, on Afghanistan with zero Afghanistan researcher. And in the end, you will put some post-colonial pepper and salt over this and everything is addressed. So I think I also find about like the impossibility of solidarity in these contexts. Thank you. I'm just like, you know, maybe uh, following up the uh, Fatima's question as well. And then uh, he, maybe could you please elaborate a bit more, especially in relation to what Tatiana said about, you know, because you said, uh, you know, cancel culture might be one of the biggest pressures on academic freedom. If I miss, I might have misunderstood. But like, there was some kind of, you know, the, it created a huge dilemma in Turkey as well. And then, you know, the, also in the US, we see the same thing, uh, especially now the Harvard anthropology case, uh, John Kamarov was there. So it's just like a sounds like really tricky for me. And then Tatiana also following up, because you said the solidarity is, uh, you know, institutional solidarity is what you have in mind first, because you know, the, I'm teaching somehow, I was teaching in Turkey. And then of course, this denunciations are like really huge things that people write through the, like a presidential, this kind of complaint system. And then you might be, you know, insulting the president or some of this kind of uh, things. But there is solidarity with your colleagues mostly. You know, the people try to shield. And in my research in bureaucracy as well, you know, there are complaints and people try to protect one another. And then there is like, you know, rather than atomization, we always see this kind of even uh, super politicized, you know, and then when it's explicitly forbidden, by the way, by law, we are public employees, for instance, and you can't be really affiliated with like a government of a I don't know, political party. You can't really express political opinions in public office, but people do quite a lot because they want to you know, the, uh, protect one another and they have this kind of horizontal links and solidarity links almost. How does this operate there? This is my question. Thank you. It's okay, we will manage. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. I really learned a lot about uh, uh, each case. I want maybe to follow up after Fatima and ask what can we do as young scholars? And if we over uh, focus on universities, and not searching and doing alternative platform for knowledge production, maybe we are reproducing the same power relations. So, because all your intervention were about the institution, about the universities, the statistics, the situation there. And I'm asking if we are not, by pursuing all the time the academic uh, position in university, we are again reproducing the same dynamics. So maybe if you can elaborate, it's, it's also related to what you, Thomas, said about doing something out of university. So if you can, in the other cases, Russia and Kashmir, if you can talk a little, about, um, a little more about alternatives platform out of the official academy. But my second question is to Achim. And I have comment and a question uh, uh, about uh, the 
agnotology, the deliberated ignorance about Palestine and the Palestinians in Germany. So what are the forces, from your point of view, who are playing a, in this you know, power relation in Germany? I can't tell about this in Palestine, but in Israel. But my, maybe my comment is, you know, the terminology and the words has, are very powerful, Nam the naming. And again, you and Urker mentioned Palestine as an issue or as a conflict. And we know that conflict assume the balance between two powers. And we know that there's, it's colonization and we need to name it as such. As we do in Russia and say it's not the operation, special operation against Ukraine, it's war. So maybe the censorship and the word that we use also play a role in reproducing this agnotology about Palestine and Palestinians. So it's, a, it's colonization, it's 74 years of colonization, and we should start saying it as is. It's not an issue and it's not a conflict. So this is my comment and thank you. Very good question, Jumaida. So, uh, how uh, first we get three questions and then maybe. And then maybe we can have another round, right? If that's okay with you. Um, maybe we can start with Ahim. No, it's not. <laughs> it is. It is? Yeah. Now it is, okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, I mean, uh, the, the um, comments uh, um, were received. I would say, of course, we were speaking very much with an institutional um, perspective. I mean, I'm, I'm part of this academic system, as precarious as it might be, but I'm... Um, surely there's this kind of institutional blindness <laughs> that I also um, um, reenact here uh, to a degree. Um, it's true. I mean, there is uh, solidarity in a neoliberal um, system is very difficult uh, to organize. Academy Next Hell as a project is an attempt to organize a degree of solidarity, international transnational solidarity, by creating opportunities for scholars at risk, mostly from countries of the global south, but as we can see, um, it is, you know, this authoritarian wave is encroaching and coming closer. We have colleagues from Poland, from Russia, from Hungary, um, from Serbia, um, um, the Middle East, from Pakistan, from, you know, many, many different countries. Actually, the IRGAC program is very, um, um, very open to um, South American um, colleagues, which are only faintly represented in our program. Strangely enough, um, I don't know why, uh, how this came about, but this um, we can't do it all, probably. <laughs> um, these windows of opportunity, these spaces that we can use in the existing system, um, they are kind of ambivalent, you see? There's the strategy of internationalization that very much follows a neoliberal strategy of cherry picking um, and uh, to integrate um, a scholar from the global south and a project is kind of, you know, a, a plus. We know they're only here for a couple of years and then they leave again. So, uh, after all, it's mostly for the prestige and the profit of the existing system and it reproduces the existing system. You're completely right. At the same time, on an individual, as you, if you will, voluntaristic 
level, we do create uh, options for people like the ones who are sitting here next to me on this panel to actually get out and do something um, for at least a limited period of time. And um, Academy in Exile is a small project um, with which tries as good as you know as as good as we can to also um, create follow up options and in you know just just one um, point that we take pride in is uh, that more than eighty percent of our fellows um, can attain uh, you know have attained follow up options. Um, after these two years. So as precarious as this still might be, there is a, for many people, um, uh, um, they, ha they have a, you know, a foot on the ground and they slowly m might be able to build a, you know, a second life in, in Europe, which is not nothing, I would say. But uh, I agree, in, in, uh, systematically speaking, it's almost impossible to organize solidarity in a neoliberal system. Um, Yes, please. <laughs> I somehow share pessimism with you, uh, Fatima. <laughs> uh, I, I, I uh, arrived here in a, in a set of very difficult circumstances and thankfully I was rescued out. I, I, st I could start my academic uh, career all over again. But uh, like, like I said, like authoritarianism, how it reaches the university system back home, there's not a day when I don't hear like last week, a friend of mine uh, was terminated from his job because he has two publications which are published in like proper ISSN journals. They, they, uh, they have the potential of radicalizing young Kashmiris. Nobody would have an access to, like the, hardly anyone would have access to, uh, you know, those journals, but the guy stands terminated. Then there's another professor. He's a chem professor of chemistry and he has seven, 65 publications in last 10 years, which is huge. And at some point of time, he has, uh, like he has had a student who was involved with anti-state activities. Now this person gets terminated uh, like as recently as this Friday, and he was just given 36 hours to leave his official residence. And uh, so I, I, I had a chance to speak to him. He said, like, right now I'm just busy with moving. I can't think of anything. I will eventually go to the court, but let me see. May, he's, he's, you know, he's holding on to Ford that I will show them I was working all this while. I had 15 PhDs and 65 publications. How could I do anything that was, like, not supporting the state? I don't know, but it's then it's at the end of the day, it's resilience of people. Like, in Kashmir, what is happening in India from 2014 in Kashmir, it was happening from last 30 years or more. But it's that resilience of people that that sustains. I think I, I don't think like structures have the capacity to have the capacity to sustain it. It's resilience, one small act of resilience, some hand holding, some finger holding, a conversation at the time of distress, writing together, reading together. I know that that's all that can sustain hope in these dark times. Tatiana, would you like to comment? Thank you. No, thank you very much for the uh, for the question about the um, uh, solidarity of professors. But uh, in Russia, as I as, as I as I see, it's a um, different situation before the war in Ukraine and after the war in Ukraine. Before the war in Ukraine. Um, I haven't actually I haven't seen much solidarity um, as uh, I have been in a position of academic activism uh, I have been uh, in a strange position actually um, 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 as as, a, as an example, then uh, professors were fired from the university in 2020. Uh, it was mostly students who was protested, um, who were protested, not the the professors, uh, because the because my former university is the best, uh, one of the best paid universities in in the country. So probably, uh, and it is dangerous to um, protest. <laughs> uh, 
so I understand this position because uh, lots of colleagues are in the situation that they care for someone, uh, younger or older. So, uh, um, and uh, the solidarity also depends on the topic. For example, if there are a topic of uh, human rights, for example, um, uh, persons can gain much more solidarity than uh, in the case of, uh, for example, feminism or harassment. Um, and uh, uh, probably a month ago or so, uh, my, a colleague of mine described a faculty recruitment strategy, which, is, uh, which she sees now uh, in, in, in the university. Uh, it is like um, the, um, pe how to say, people on the board are seeing the CVs of persons and uh, then they are like uh, talking with each other. Oh, publications uh, on uh, feminism in highly cited journals like Q1 or something like this. No, no, we don't need those. <laughs> this is very dangerous to have. Uh, uh, professors who are writing on feminism and gender issues. So uh, I, I, I just recollect that I was doing uh, some um, um, academic activism. Um, the, the people who supported me was my colleagues, but it was quite silently, or it was some small circle, and also students. Uh, so uh, that, that was students who uh, invited me to their like collaborations or something, um, not the colleagues in the university um, because the topics were so touching. And also uh, then I, I've been dismissed uh, from the university. Um, there became a solidarity of uh, the, how to say, uh, of, of the projects outside the university. Uh, so outside the university, it is possible to, to also to gain some solidarity. So it, it is really a difficult question. And now uh, in, 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 in the current situation, um, I, it, it is just not, not very possible. I don't see how it is possible. So uh, my colleagues are helping uh, other colleagues who are dismissed from the universities to find a new place somewhere else or <laughs> on a new country or something like this. Uh, this is what I see. So, so, sorry, it's not uh, very optimistic. <laughs> Thank you for, for all your questions. And uh, yes, yes, it's such a difficult, vexed, uh, uh, impossible question uh, how to uh, not reproduce but uh, to, 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 to be as, as scholars, as students, as auxiliary personnel, uh, academically free, uh, in neoliberalism and uh, you know the word solidarity which I think uh, Tamara was, uh, Tatiana, sorry, <laughs> was the first to, uh, to, to, to use. Um, solidarity reminds me always of the solidarity of Poland of uh, 1980 and my first year in high school. So I remember then that we also striked for workers. And uh, if, if pupils, students, auxiliary personnel, students, uh, co-work, co co-host, co co, uh, collaborate, uh, are hospitable to each other and to the society as such, uh, then perhaps there is hope. And uh, when I think about this solidarity back then, not, not yet, as I was saying, as a far-right party, political party, that solidarity uh, had changed into um, the solidarity of 1980, uh, was quite uh, 
activist, academic, there was both the so-called, what we call in Eastern Europe, intelligentsia <laughs> and, and the workers together. And that was the beautiful time, the, the time of my life, 1980, 1981, when finally it was, uh, it was ended by martial law in, in Poland. And uh, significantly, the uh, union of, uh, of, of the auxiliary personnel at my university is called Solidarity 80. So perhaps there is hope for 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 what you've been all s s saying. Thank you. Let's have another three questions. Huh. That's huh. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so if you allow me just a sh very short comment because um, Himmat has it had addressed the question to me very personally oh, of course, of in the course, previous yeah. round and I didn't Please come do. around no. answering you, Himmat. <laughs> um, how did we arrive at this point of, you know, um, ignorance towards um, the uh, situation in Israel-Palestine that has been going on for such a long time. Uh, I, I wouldn't go into this right now because it would take too much time. Um, uh, but how to address this current situation that we do have, and I would agree with you, there is a deliberate ignorance towards Palestinian perspectives and also uh, regarding the, the, you know, the history of, as you would call it the colonization of Palestine or the Israel-Palestine conflict as you you know uh, as you might um, call it um, well you know I'm part of a loose, loose network called um, expanding spaces um, because I do think that in order to address this or uh, to answer this um, um, in well, the, the, the shrinking spaces regarding um, uh, discourse about Israel-Palestine in this country, you do have somehow to organize and fight back because it's, uh, it's an organized um, a trend, you know, supported by powerful figures in politics and media. Um, so you have to somehow uh, respond to this, for instance, by um, answering this trend towards deplatforming Palestinian perspectives in public spaces by taking these um, places to court. And there has been um, successful um, you know, um, cases in the past few months where um, courts have um, held up the principle of freedom of speech um, and held it higher than this trend towards, you know, the call towards deplatforming de Palestinian perspectives. So this is one point, I think, that you need to um, organize yourselves. I think it would also make sense if people gave more space in universities or outside universities <laughs> um, to include Palestinian voices, which is not very common in, in Germany as a result of this you know, general atmosphere. And um, well, I mean, you are one of those um, persons, <laughs> um, and there's uh, there's others, um, but there's the it's it's way it's not very um, common until now. Um, it used to be more frequent in previous decades, I would say. Um, well, that's another issue that can be tackled. The, you know, giving the floor to Palestinian um, voices and perspectives. How you would organize this and how you would be you know, how you would be kind of man how able to stand the pressure and the blowback that would inevitably follow you know any institution who would um, nowadays organize a panel including Himmat Zorbi, Judith Butler and you know p they would be just there would be serious blowback <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah um, so, um, I mean, the, the Jewish Museum in Berlin has organized these kinds of panels in the past. They wouldn't do so today. So this is uh, an institutional thing and, and, of course, not only given to individual decisions by people like us. But this, um, this would be a strategy, but it's a long way. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, let's have three questions, but try to keep it short. We have two. Okay, yeah. It's on. Well, thank you so much for the panel. It was really wonderful. I also want to thank Fatima for raising the, the question of the big challenges and obstacles to solidarity that comes so glaringly when you speak of academic solidarity. But I just want to remind you, Fatima, that the problem goes beyond this particular field. I think we are coping with huge challenges and problems of solidarity elsewhere, huh? in social movements, in society itself. So maybe this is a suggestion for the organizers. Uh, the challenge of solidarity could be one topic for the assembly on, on Saturday, because it's, it's a huge one that needs much more thought about it. Having said that, I was once again very impressed how you were speaking, all of you, and it, it was just like as if I was in Brazil or in Latin America or even the US, because the patterns you describe, except for Germany, which is a little bit less intense, are very, very similar to what we are watching everywhere particularly this, at this accusation of politicizing universities. Huh? This is a very common thread, and, and cancel culture and all of that is, is across our region. Huh? And, but I, this is just a comment. I, want, I have two questions. The first, if, and this is related to solidarity in <laughs> some ways, in many ways. Uh, looking at the problem from Brazil, uh, we observe that in the case of Brazil, attacks on ideology in education, politicizing education, gender in education, sexuality in education, did not begin with the academy. It began in basic education. And this is somehow the pattern across Latin America. It shifted to the academy later on. No? And, and in our case, I observe um, a lack of solidarity <laughs> between these two universes. This, the conversations are not, uh, now it began to converge, but can you imagine it's 10 years later? No? So this is one observation. But I want to ask if in your experiences in Poland, in Germany, uh, in India, in, in, in Russia, there's a correspondent attack on basic education as well, and how does it go? And my second question is, uh, I'm very concerned right now, not so much about I'm very concerned about how the right and the conservative forces have you reorganized and their attacks, but I'm also very concerned about their capacity of knowledge production, the epistemic politics of the right wing. Huh? And so I would ask you also what you can say about that in your context. What are the institutions the academic institutions that are producing and deploying knowledge, <laughs> uh, theoretical arguments. You may say they are fake, that you may disagree, but there's a vast knowledge production emerging from the right and how this is playing in your context. And I know it's, I'm thinking of India, all the knowledge production on the historical reconstruction. Yeah? Okay, so leave it. Yeah, okay. I'm stopping here, <laughs> okay. Okay. It works, it works, yeah. Okay, thank you a lot. Uh, I have a question for Urker. If you can share shortly your experience in Turkey yeah, of course, and because it's very important also. Your experience and your colleague experience, I think, is, makes sense. Thank you. 
Hello. Do you hear me? Okay. The mic is working. Um, I just want to join with you all in, in calling for the international solidarity by giving the example of the Burmese uh, revolution now. Um, we had the coup in February uh, last year. Um, university professor, uh, 225,000 of them lost the job because of their strike uh, by participating in civil disobedience movement, which means like the anti-coup protests, not going to the campus anymore. Um, but the, how some of the German university perceive that action is quite shocking to me because they want to continue a kind of status quo. They want to engage with the research project as business as usual, rather than recognizing the actions of the university professor as a revolutionary act. Rather, you know, like they accuse the Burmese professors and lecturers who lost the job as destroying and paralyzing the education system and destroying the rights of education for the students. That's that, you know, like the kind of neoliberal thinking and the, the, the want to the desire to maintain the status quo, really damaging to the revolutionary path we are having now. So in this kind of environment, you know, Obama revolution is not the last one, I guess, because we have, you know, we are fighting against the authoritarian system everywhere now. So in this case, I, I really think, you know, this is time to more focus on the international solidarity and we, we have to call the revolution when it's happened as a revolution. This is a kind of courageous acts rather than denouncing them. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I try to keep very short. Uh, I just um, um, open the floor to discuss about the um, another type of academic solidarity with academy itself. I think we should, all around the world, just think about the place of academia for democracies. So other than being like uh, knowledge factories of power uh, in in power in governments like in north is just uh, although it's called very free democracies i think uh, there too universities are acting like you know knowledge factories for governments with all these neoliberal turn at the same time so maybe defining uh, academy again uh, with its uh, importance for democracies starting with there, just both criticizing the place of academy itself and trying to imagine another kind of academy everywhere, um, to um, then start solid to solid, um, being solidarity with uh, universities under authoritarian regimes would be more powerful than we, um, you know, um, then, the importance of democratic capacity of society would be on the agenda, not just the academics itself. Uh, we can just talk much, but uh, I just want to cut it here. Thank you. Okay, just a short question like, uh, to Arshi about the counter strategies uh, in India, like uh, for academic freedom, uh, are they inclusive of uh, Kashmiri situation? Because when we talk about or uh, write about academic freedom in India and Kashmir, the situation is totally different. So how much it, the civil society and counter strategies are inclusive of, uh, of Kashmiri situation? Thank you. Okay, um, how do you wanna go? Uh, him, do you, okay. I think Maybe you, yeah, yeah uh, there's minimal inclusivity when it comes to Kashmir. Uh, for the longest time, uh, the, the most progressive movements, the most progressive left movements could not incorporate the Kashmiri question or the question of academic freedom in Kashmir. And academic freedom in Kashmir is another, it's another, like uh, this, in this summer, uh, uh, people were put on no flying list. Like uh, your passport is not taken away, just that you are deboarded from a plane. And uh, who, who was it happening to? It was happening to academics. Uh, right now, for the state, the, the academics uh, is the potential category which has to be uh, demolished at all costs. So people get uh, admissions in universities outside India. They are deboarded from planes for no reason. 
and book as many flights, you will be deboarded. So uh, it's a, a very minimal portion of uh, like Indian uh, civil society understands these uh, uh, these concerns and tries to incorporate it, but it's it's microscopic minority. Uh, you were asking about the institutions. I think like the best game changer in India is not the you know like the game changer in India is not the university education. It is the school education. The whole uh, school education was consolidated and for uh, and uh, uh, you know con constituted under a body called Central Board of Secondary Schools Education, and this is the this is the uh, th this model actively promoted the idea of sciences and technology as uh, human uh, social sciences are not to be looked at language is not to be looked at you have to be the uh, what do you say production of knowledge should happen in terms of science and technology now this starts from kg this starts from kindergarten and uh, by the time these students are 18 they are competing for uh, exam for, for these nationalized entrances for engineering and uh, and and rest of the scientific uh, institutes these institutions in turn they have become uh, radicalized dens for the right wing but i don't think it starts uh, in the highest uh, you know at the college it starts very much in the school when you kill that temper for social sciences for humanities uh, the syllabus you, you must have uh, been reading about how the uh, course outlines have been changed how uh, nothing is being taught about the muslim past or about uh, or about like lot of things which are important in the historical sense we can talk more about it yeah i was stepping Now it's on, okay. Um, so I agree that, you know, of course, a more, um, uh, a broader approach to the whole educational system is um, a, a crucial um, broadening of the perspective in order to understand what's going on and to actually have an impact. Um, very true. I don't think I have the time to elaborate here on the um, intricacies of the German education system, the school system, um, but I generally tend to agree and we might go on discussing um, details afterwards. Um, I think the influence of the these you know, right-wing um, uh, knowledge production that you mentioned in your intervention um, previously, it, in Germany it exists, but it's not on the level of the um, you know, uh, institutions of the, the recognized institutions of knowledge production in universities or in non-university research institutes um, uh, of the Max Planck Society, of the Leibniz Society, etc. It's not there yet. Um, there is, on the fringes of the system, there's kind of um, uh, institutes that produce this kind of knowledge, but they are recognized as what they are and they're not very respected. So I would say that we are still a far cry from what the situation is in other countries. And the colleague who sat next to you, um, Fatima, I think is your name, right? Uh, who raised the question in the initially regarding this issue of cancel culture in, in German academia. Um, that was an argument that is raised by this conservative network that's called Academic Freedom Network, which is a what I would call a conservative attempt to hijack the issue of academic freedom by kind of gaslighting um, this, you know, academic freedom is under threat th due to cancel culture by, polit by PC uh, scholars and, and, and uh, mobilized students. This is, of course, crap. Um, and I didn't mean to, um, you know, own this argument myself. <laughs> I just was reporting that this uh, assault exists, but it's not very strong, to be honest. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, it's well-established colleagues who, however, are recognized as representing a certain political current, and you know, you put them in perspective. And so, uh, as the close closure, I'm giving the word to myself. Maybe I, I I'm really actually very inspired by uh, this. Um, this class solidarity concept. And then, then I remember like a very old concept, union, 
Maybe that's the answer to, maybe uh, that's the answer to your question too, because I'm from Turkey and we experience all of these things, like, I don't know, some years ago, probably we don't even want to talk about those experiences. Uh, but our union, which is a union of administrative personnel and the academics, of course there's a hierarchy in the unions too, but there is, it, at least uh, it has been a space, it still, it still exists, uh, it's a space to discuss, to challenge those like class hierarchies or I don't know, like cultural capital, uh, power inequalities, that kind of relations. And even though, I mean, there have been some maybe mistakes of our union too along this process, it has been, I guess, like very powerful in defending our rights and creating these spaces of discussion and democratization and making this knowledge to, um, I don't know, to infiltrate to other, other levels of society outside the academia. Because like through the union, you have these connections. But in the academy, you don't have these connections because like even though you have the students, even though you care for making education not private and open to the public as much as possible, the union uh, works as this channel. And yeah, that's my closing remark. I think <laughs> we can go and eat now. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, thank you.